Joseph, Antwerp, Belgium, 1939, 36 days from home. The St. Louis was throwing a party, even bigger than the one it had thrown the night before they'd reached Cuba. This one had the euphoria of more than 900 people who had been at death's door and were suddenly miraculously saved. Belgium, Holland, France, and England had agreed to divide the refugees among them. None of the passengers were going back to Germany. Joseph's mother wasn't alone on the dance floor anymore. She was joined by dozens of couples all dancing with giddy abandon. Joseph had even taken a turn around the floor with her. Passengers sang songs and played the piano with the orchestra, and one man who knew magic tricks entertained Ruthie and the other little kids in the corner of the social hall. In another corner, Joseph laughed as passengers tur took turns telling jokes. Most of the jokes were about taking holiday cruises to Cuba, but the best was when one of the passengers got up and read from the brochure that advertised the MS St. Louis. The St. Louis is a ship on which everyone travels securely and lives in comfort, he read. You could barely hear him over the hooting. There is everything one can wish for, the man read, gasping for breath, that makes life on board a pleasure. We hope you'll want to travel on the St. Louis again and again. Joseph laughed so hard he cried. If he never saw the MS St. Louis again in his life, he would die happy. The next morning, the ship docked at a pier in Antwerp, Belgium. Negotiations between Captain Schroeder and the four countries still took time, and it was a full day later when, under the grim portrait of Adolf Hitler, Joseph and his family joined the other passengers in the social hall again to find out where they would be going. Representatives from the four countries sat at a long table in the front of the hall, arguing over which passengers each would take. Every country wanted only the passengers with the best chances of getting accepted by America so they could ship the refugees back out as quickly as possible. Joseph hoped they would get England because it was the farthest away from Nazi Germany safe across the English Channel. But when everything was settled, he and his family were assigned to France. They would be among the third group to disembark after the Jewish refugees going to Belgium and the Netherlands were delivered, but before the last group sailed for Great Britain. The first group left that afternoon. Joseph watched with most of the passengers as the refugees going to Belgium disembarked. Joseph didn't want to go to Belgium, but he was jealous nonetheless. Like everybody else, he was ready to get off this ship. Think of it, we traveled 10,000 miles on board the St. Louis, one of the men leaving for Belgium told the other passengers as he stepped onto the gangplank, only to end up 300 miles from where we started. That line got a laugh, but a sad one. Joseph was all too aware of the long shadow cast by Nazi Germany, and so was everyone else. Still, as long as the Nazis stayed in Germany, they would all be safe, wouldn't they? The next day, 181 passengers disembarked in the city of Rotterdam, even though Holland wouldn't let the St. Louis dock at their pier, just like in Havana. The refugees were taken into town by another ship and escorted by police boats. As they sailed onto France, Joseph wandered the decks. The ship had a strange, empty feeling to it. Half the passengers were gone. The morning they arrived in Bologna, France, the 288 passengers who were traveling onto England gathered on sea deck to say farewell to Joseph and the others who were disembarking. We're due into England tomorrow, Joseph heard one of them say, June 21st. That's exactly 40 days and 40 nights in a boat. Now, where have I heard that story before? Joseph smiled, remembering the story of Noah from the Torah. But he felt less like Noah and more like Moses, wandering in the desert for 40 years before reaching the Promised Land. Was that France? The Promised Land at last? Joseph could only pray it was. He picked up his suitcase in one hand, took Ruthie's hand with his other, and led her and their mother down the ramp into Bologna. You see, Mama said, I told you somebody would think of something. Now stay close and don't lose your coats. The bottom of the ramp, Joseph watched as one of the other passengers got down on his hands and knees and kissed the ground. If he hadn't had his hands full, Joseph might have done the same thing. The Secretary General of the French Refugee Assistance Committee officially welcomed them to France, and the porters on the docks moved quickly to carry the passengers' luggage for them, refusing any and all tips offered. Maybe this was the promised land after all. Joseph and his mother and sister spent the night in a hotel in Bologna, and then they were taken by train to Le Mans, where they were put up in a chief lodging house. Days passed, and life went on. Joseph's mother got work doing other people's laundry. Ruthie went to kindergarten at last, and Joseph went to school for the first time in months, but because he couldn't speak French, they put him in the first grade. Thirteen years old, a man, and they put him in a classroom with seven-year-olds. It was humiliating. Joseph promised himself he would learn to speak French over the summer or die trying. He never got the chance. Two months later, Germany invaded Poland, touching off a new world war. Eight months after that, Germany invaded France, and Joseph and his mother and sister were on the run again. Isabel off the coast of Florida, 1994, five days from home. Isabel's mother cried out, it's coming, it's coming. Isabel didn't know she meant the baby or the Coast Guard ship, or both. Paddle, Amara cried. Isabel paddled harder. 
She could see the shore, could see the beach umbrellas folded up for the night but still stuck in the sand. Strings of lights, palm trees, more music, a salsa now. It was all so close. But so was the Coast Guard ship. It bore down on them, its red lights flashing, its powerful motor thrumming, water sluicing from its bow. Isabel's heart hammered. It was going to catch them. They weren't going to make it. Leto froze again. It's Leto froze. It's happening again, he said. What? What do you mean? Isabel asked, panting. When I was a young man, I was a policeman, Leto said, his eyes wild. There was a ship, a ship full of Jews from Europe, and we sent them back. I sent them back. Sent them back to die when we could have so easily taken them in. It was all politics, but they were people, real people. I met them. I knew them by name. I don't understand, Isabel said. What did her grandfather's story have to do with anything? Paddle, Isabel's father cried. The Coast Guard boat was almost on top of them. Don't you see, Leto said. The Jewish people on the ship were seeking asylum, just like us. They needed a place to hide from Hitler, from the Nazis. Manana, we told them, we'll let you in manana, but we never did. Leto was crying now, distraught. We sent them back to Europe and Hitler and the Holocaust, back to their deaths. How many of them died because we turned them away? Because I was just doing my job. Isabel didn't know what ship her grandfather was talking about, but she knew about the Holocaust from school. The millions of European Jews who had been murdered by the Nazis, and now her grandfather was saying that a ship full of Jewish refugees had come to Cuba when he was a young man, that he had helped to send them away? Manana. Suddenly, Isabel understood why her grandfather had been whispering that word over and over again for days. Why it haunted him. When would the Jews be led into Cuba? Manana. When would their boat reach America? Manana. Manana had never come for the Jewish people on that ship, Isabel realized. Would Manana never come for Isabel and her family either? A calm came over Lido, as though he'd come to some sort of understanding, some decision. I see it now, Chabella, all of it. The past, the present, the future. All my life I kept waiting for things to get better, for the bright promise of Manana. But a funny thing happened while I was waiting for the world to change Chabella. It didn't, because I didn't change it. I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. Take care of your mother and baby brother for me. Lido, what are you? Don't stop rowing for shore, Isabel's grandfather yelled to everyone else. He kissed Isabel on the cheek, surprising her, and then stood and jumped into the ocean. Lido, Isabel cried. Lido! Papa, Isabel's mother cried. What's he doing? Isabel's grandfather popped up a few meters away, his head appearing and disappearing in the waves. Lido, Isabel cried. Help, he cried, waving his arms at the Coast Guard ship while at the same time swimming away from it. Help me, he yelled. He jumped in to distract them, Poppy realized. They'll come for us first, Senor Castillo said. No, he's in danger of drowning. They have to rescue him, Amara cried. This is our chance. Row, row! Tears rolled down Isabel's cheek where her grandfather had just kissed her goodbye. Lido, she cried again, reaching out for him over the waves. Don't worry about me, Chabella. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's treading water, Lido yelled back. Now row! Manana is yours, my beautiful songbird. Go to Miami and be free. Isabel sobbed. She couldn't paddle, couldn't row, couldn't do anything but watch as the Coast Guard ship veered away from their little boat and steered toward her grandfather, went to save him, and sent him back to Guantanamo, back to Cuba. Mahmoud, Hungary, 2015, 17 days from home. They came for Mahmoud and his father again the next morning, this time to take them to a crowded refugee camp in a cold, muddy field surrounded by a wire fence. Multicolored camping tents stood among heaps of trash and discarded clothes, and Hungarian soldiers in blue uniforms and white surgical masks guarded the entrances and exits. There was only one real building, a windowless cinderblock warehouse filled with row after row of metal cots. Mahmoud and his father found Mom and Walid among the newly arrived refugees, and they shared a tearful reunion. They were each given a blanket and a bottle of water and found cots for themselves. But when the food was delivered, they missed out. The Hungarian soldiers stood at one end of the room, tossing sandwiches into the crowd like zookeepers throwing food to the animals in a cage, and Mahmoud and his family didn't know enough to rush the tables to catch their lunch. Mahmoud expected his father to laugh it off, but he wasn't joking anymore. Instead, Dad sat on his cot, his face and arms purple and bruised, staring off into space. Getting beaten and thrown into prison by the Hungarians had finally broken his spirit. It scared Mahmoud. Of the four members of his family who were left, he was the only one who wasn't broken. His mother had snapped the moment she handed her daughter away, and now she wandered the maze of mattresses and blankets in the detention center, asking people she had already asked if they had seen or heard of a baby named Hana. Mahmoud's brother Walid was broken too, but unlike his mother, he had been broken piece by piece over time like someone snapping off little bites of a chocolate bar until there was nothing left. He lay listless on a foam mattress, disinterested in the card games or soccer games that other children were playing. 
Whatever childish joy he had once possessed had been sucked out until there was nothing left. And now his father was dead inside too. Mahmoud fumed. Why were they even here? Why did the Hungarians care if they were just passing through? Why had they taken them all the way to the Austrian border only to throw them in a detention center? It felt personal somehow, like the whole country was conspiring to, find, to keep them from finding a real home. There were policemen with guns at every door. They were more like prisoners than refugees, and when they got out of here, it would be, just be to go back to Syria, back to another country that didn't want them. After everything they had been through, they weren't going to make it to Germany after all. But Mahmoud wasn't ready to give up. He wanted life to be like what it was before the war had come. They couldn't go back to Syria, not now, Mahmoud knew that, but there was no reason they couldn't make a new life for themselves somewhere else, start over, be happy again, and Mahmoud wanted to do whatever it took to make that happen, or at least try. But making something happen meant drawing attention, being visible, and being invisible was so much easier. It was useful too, like in Aleppo or Serbia or here in Hungary. But sometimes it was just as useful to be visible, like in Turkey and Greece. The reverse was true too though, being invisible had hurt them as much as being visible had. Mahmoud frowned. That was the real truth of it, wasn't it? Whether you were visible or invisible, it was all about how other people reacted to you. Good and bad things happened either way. If you were invisible, the bad people couldn't hurt you, that was true, but the good people couldn't help you either. If you stayed invisible here, did everything you were supposed to and never made waves, you would disappear from the eyes and minds of all the good people out there who could help you get your life back. It was better to be visible, to stand up, to stand out. Mahmoud watched as a door on a nearby wall opened and a group of men and women in light blue caps and vests with the letters UN written on them came inside, escorted by some important looking Hungarian soldiers. Mahmoud knew that the UN was the United Nations, the same group that had been helping people at the Killis refugee camp. The UN people carried clipboards and cell phones and made notes and took pictures of the living conditions. This place was run by the Hungarians, not the UN, so Mahmoud guessed they were there to observe, to document the living conditions of the refugees. Mahmoud decided right then and there that he was going to make sure the observers saw him. Mahmoud got up from his cot and walked to the door. All he had to do was push his way through and he would be outside, but a Hungarian soldier stood guard next to it. She wore a blue uniform, a red cap, and a thick black leather belt that held a nightstick and had all kinds of compartments. Over her shoulder, she carried a small automatic rifle on a strap, the barrel pointed at the gymnasium floor. The guard ignored Mahmoud. He stood right in front of her, but she looked over him, past him. Mahmoud was invisible as long as he did what he was supposed to do, and as long as he was invisible, he was safe, and she was comfortable. It was time for both of those things to change. Mahmoud took a deep breath and pushed the door open. Chuck, chuck. The sound echoed loudly in the big room, and suddenly all the kids stopped playing, and all the adults looked up from their mattresses at him. It was green outside and sunny, and at first Mahmoud had to squint to see. Hey, the guard cried. She saw him now, didn't she? The UN observers did too. Stop. No, not allowed, the soldier said in bad Arabic. She struggled to find the right words and said something in Hungarian that Mahmoud didn't understand. She started to raise her gun at him, and then she glanced up and saw the frowns on the faces of the UN observers. Mahmoud stepped outside. The woman looked around at the other guards and called out to them, as if asking what to do. Mahmoud took another step, and another, and soon he was away from the building, walking towards the road. Walid ran through the door after him, followed by the rest of the children. The Hungarian guards yelled after them, but they didn't do anything to stop them. Mahmoud, Walid said, panting as he ran alongside his brother. His eyes were bright and alive for the first time since Mahmoud could remember. Mahmoud, what are you doing? I'm not staying in that place and waiting for them to send me back to Serbia. Come on, Mahmoud said. We're walking to Austria. Joseph, Vornay, France, 1940. One year, one month, and ten days from home. Gunfire crackled, an artillery shell whistled overhead and hit with a shuddering thum somewhere nearby. Ruthie cried and Joseph's mother hugged her close. Joseph peeked out the window. They were hiding in a tiny schoolhouse in a village called Vornay, somewhere south of Bourges in France. The desks were all in perfect rows and a long forget forgotten assignment was still written on the chalkboard. It was dark outside and the trees surrounding the schoolhouse made it even darker. That was good, it helped them hide. But it also made spotting German stormtroopers harder. Joseph ducked back down inside and his eyes fell on a map of Europe on the wall, the various countries shaded different colors. How wrong that map was now, just a year after he and his family had come to France as refugees. Germany had absorbed Austria and conquered Poland and Czechoslovakia soon after. Holland and Belgium and, Del Belgium and Denmark had fallen to Hitler, and the no Nazis occupied the northern half of France, including Paris. All of France had surrendered, but there were still pockets of free France forces resisting the Nazis throughout the countryside. The countryside was where Joseph and his family were now. 
The only refugees from the St. Louis who were still safe, Joseph realized, were the ones who had made it to Great Britain. The word was that Hitler was going to try to cross the English Channel any day now. Joseph and his mother and sister were trying to get to Switzerland in the hope that the Swiss would give them refuge. They'd made it this far traveling by night, sleeping in hay barns and out in the fields under stars, but then the Nazis had finally caught up to them. A light played across the window above him and Joseph chanced to look out, out again. Stormtroopers headed toward the school. They're coming, Joseph told his mother. We have to go. His mother picked up Ruthie and headed for the door, but Joseph stopped her. There was only one door to the schoolhouse and the Nazis would be using it. Joseph kept low as he scurried to the back wall of the classroom. There was a window there. They could climb out and run for the woods. He tried the handle. It was stuck. Joseph looked over his shoulder. He could see the beam of a flashlight in the hall outside, could hear the familiar German language of his homeland. They had to get out of there. Joseph threw his elbow against the glass and it shattered. That brought a cry from the hallway. Joseph knocked the rest of the glass out of the window in a panic. He felt his coat sleeve rip, felt something cold and sharp against his skin, but he didn't have time to think about that. He helped his mother out first, then handed Ruthie out to her through the window. Go, go, Joseph said before he was even all the way out the window, and his mother picked up Ruthie and ran for the darkness of the woods. None of them carried suitcases anymore. Those had been left behind long ago, but they all still wore their coats even though it was the height of summer. His mother had insisted. The only thing any of them still carried was Bitsy, the little stuffed bunny Ruthie had never parted with. It was tucked tightly under Ruthie's arm. Joseph leaped down from the window, stumbled, got back up, and ran. There, there, the beam of the flashlight found him. A pistol cracked, and a, blue, a bullet blew the bark off a tree less than a meter away from him. Joseph stumbled again in panic, righted himself, and kept running. Behind him, the stormtroopers were yelling to each other, barking like dogs after a fox. They were on the scent now and wouldn't let up, not until Joseph and his family had been caught. There is a house up ahead, his mother yelled over her shoulder. She swerved onto a small dirt lane, and Joseph overtook her, beating her to the door. It was a little French country house with two windows on either side of a double door in the middle and a chimney on one side. Joseph caught a faint whiff of smoke from the kitchen fire, and a curtain fluttered in the window. Someone was inside. Joseph pounded on the door. He glanced over his shoulder. Three flashlight beams were bouncing up the lane toward them. Help, please help us, Joseph whispered frantically, still pounding. No one answered, and no lights came on inside. Halt came a young man's voice. Joseph spun around. There were four German soldiers behind them. Three of them pointed flashlights at them, making Joseph squint. He could see well enough to know that two of them had rifles pointed at them. A third carried a pistol. Hands up, put the child down, the stormtrooper told Joseph's mother. Ruthie tried to cling to her, but Mama did as she was told. Dully, Joseph realized that he lost some of the feeling in his right arm and that his sleeve was coated in blood. He cut himself on the window glass badly. He squeezed the place where his arm had grazed the glass, and the, p the pain was so blindy it almost made him pass out. Ruthie had her head down, but she raised her little bunny's right arm and said, Hell Hitler. One of the soldiers laughed, and as he blinked the pain of his arm away, Joseph thought maybe the soldiers would let them go. But one of them said, Papers. They were in trouble now for sure. Their papers had big letter J stamped all over them. J for Jew. We, we don't have any papers, Mama said. One of the soldiers gestured at her, and a stormtrooper with a rifle marched up to them and checked her coat pocket. He quickly found the papers she carried for her and Ruthie, and just as easily found Joseph's papers on him. The soldier brought them back to a man with a flashlight, and he unfolded them. Choose, the man said. From Berlin. You've run a long way from home. No idea, thought Joseph. We're going to Switzerland, Ruthie said. Hush, Ruthie, Joseph hissed. Switzerland? Is that so? Well, I'm afraid we cannot allow that, the soldier said. You will be taken to a concentration camp, like the rest of the Jews. Why, thought Joseph, why bother hunting us down and taking us back to prison? If the Nazis want us Jews gone so badly, why don't they just let us keep going? One of the soldiers came toward them with a gun. No, wait, Joseph's mother cried. I have money, Reichsmarks, French francs. She, mumbled, she fumbled inside her shirt where she kept the money hidden. The bills fluttered to the ground. The soldier moved the bills around with his feet and made it sound. It's not enough, I'm afraid. Joseph's heart sank. At the chance she might really be able to buy their way out, Joseph's mother became hysterical. Wait, wait, I have jewelry, diamonds. She yanked at Ruthie's coat, pulling it off over her head. Mama, what are you doing, Ruthie cried. Joseph's mother ripped at the seams the way his father had when he'd rent his garments for old Professor Weiler on the ship. From Ruthie's pocket, she pulled something that glittered in the light of the electric torches. Earrings. The diamond earrings Joseph's father had bought for her their, for their anniversary one year. Joseph remembered Papa giving them to her, remembered the smile on Mama's face, the light in her eyes, both long gone now. Mama had sewn her earrings into the lining of Ruthie's coat. That was why she had never let Ruthie take it off. The soldier took the earrings from Joseph's mother and examined them in the light. Joseph held his breath. Maybe they would let his mother buy their way out of this after all. Everything I was able to keep, his mother said, it's all yours. Just please let us go. These are very nice, the soldier said. 
but I think there is only enough here to buy freedom for one of your children. But that's all I have left, Mama said. The soldier looked at her expectantly. At first, Joseph didn't understand what he wanted. They didn't have anything else to give him. But then the Nazi pulled Joseph and Ruthie to him and turned them around for Mama to see, and that's when Joseph understood. The Nazi didn't care how much money they had, how many jewels. It wasn't about that. He was playing with them. This was another game, like a cat playing with a mouse before he ate it. I think there is only enough here to buy freedom for one of your children. One of Rachel Landau's children would go free, and one of her children would go into the camps. The Nazi soldier smiled at Joseph's mother. You choose. Isabel, Miami Beach, Florida, 1994, five days from home. Here, in this boat that had been her home, for four days and four nights, Isabel's little brother was born. Not, not right away. First had come her mother's frantic pushing, pushing, pushing to bring the baby into the world, while the rest of them paddled, paddled, paddled. All but Senora Castillo, who sat on the bench next to Mommy, holding her hand and talking her through it. Behind them, the Coast Guard had finished picking up Isabel's grandfather and was headed their way, lights flashing. Their little blue boat was close to the shore. The waves around them were breaking with white caps. Isabel could see people dancing on the beach, but they weren't close enough, weren't going to make it. That's when Mommy's cries had mixed with Amara's yell to swim for it, and Luis and Amara hopped over the side, half swimming, half tumbling toward shore. No, wait, Isabel cried. Her mother couldn't swim for the beach. Not like this. They had to paddle in or her mother would never make it to the United States. Isabel and Poppy and Senor Castillo rode as hard as they could, but the Coast Guard ship was faster. It was going to catch them. Go, Isabel's mother told her husband between pants. If you're caught, they'll send you back. No, Poppy said. Go, Mommy said again. If I'm caught, they'll just they'll just send me back to Cuba. Go and take Isabel. You can you can send money like you always planned. No, Isabel cried, and amazingly, her father agreed. Never, he insisted. I need you, Teresa. You and Isabel and little Mariano. Isabel's mother sobbed at the name, and tears sprang to Isabel's eyes too. Like the boat, they had never settled on a name for the baby. Not until now. Naming the baby after Lido was the perfect way to remember him, no matter where they were. But they'll send us back, Mommy sobbed. Then we'll go back, Poppy said, together. He put his forehead to his wife's temple and held her hand, taking Senora Castillo's place as Mommy made her last push. The Coast Guard ship bounced in the waves. It was almost on top of them. It's time, Senor Castillo said. We have to swim for it, now. No, please, Isabel begged, paddling helplessly against the tide, tears running down her face. They were so close, but Senor Castillo was already helping his wife over the side into the water. They were abandoning ship. Isabel's mother cried out louder than before, but Poppy was with her. He would take care of her. All that mattered now was rowing, rowing as hard as Isabel could. She was her mother's last hope. Take, take Isabel with you, she heard her mother say between pushes. But Isabel wasn't worried. She knew her father wouldn't listen, that he would never leave. Neither of them would. They were a family. They would be together forever. But then suddenly, arms were picking her up, lifting her over the side. Say goodbye to Fidel, Senor Castillo said. He was the one Mommy had been talking to. He had come back, and he was the one lifting Isabel out of the boat and into the water. No, Isabel cried. You saved my life once, now let me save yours, Castillo told her. Isabel didn't listen. She kicked and screamed, trying to get free. She didn't want to go to the States if it meant leaving her parents, her family behind. But Senor Castillo was too strong. He tossed her in the water and she sank under the waves in a tangle of arms and legs and bubbles before quickly hitting bottom. Isabel found her footing and pushed herself back up and out of the water. It was chest deep and the waves that slid by her toward shore lifted her up and set her down again on the sand. Yvonne's cap had come off in her hand in the splashdown and she snatched it up before it disappeared in the surf. Then she grabbed the side of the boat to climb back in. Senor Castillo's arm went around her waist and pulled her away. No, Isabel cried, I won't leave them. Hush, we're not going anywhere, Senor Castillo said. Help us pull the boat to shore. Isabel looked around and for the first time she saw that Senora Castillo was still there and Luis and Amara were there too. They all stood waist deep in the water around the boat. They had come back. They all, they all found somewhere to grab onto the boat and pull, churning up the sand at their feet. Isabel sobbed with relief and grabbed hold. It was harder for her to pull when the waves kept lifting her, but the sight of the Coast Guard boat bearing down on them helped motivate her. So did the cheering. The other refugees on the Coast Guard ship were hopping up and down and clapping and yelling encouragement, just like the crowd on the beach had when they'd left Havana. Isabel saw her grandfather running up and down the ship, waving them toward shore like a baseball player urging a home run ball around the, around the foul pole. She laughed in spite of herself. The water was just below Isabel's waist. They were almost there. The Coast Guard cut his ship to run up and cut his engines to run up to them, and that's when Isabel first heard her baby brother, brother cry out. The sound stunned Isabel and the others into stillness. It took her father a moment to cut the umbilical cord with his pocket knife. 
Then he stood up in the boat with something tiny and brown staring down at it like he held the world's most incredible treasure in his arms. Isabel gaped. All this time she had known her mother was having a baby. Isabel had seen plenty of babies before. They were cute, but nothing special. But this, this wasn't just a baby. This was her brother. She had never met him before this moment, but she loved him now with a deepness she had never felt before, not even toward Yvonne. This was Mariano, her little brother, and she suddenly wanted to do anything and everything she could to protect him. Poppy finally looked up from his newborn son. Help me get Teresa out of the boat, he told the others. The Coast Guard ship was almost alongside the boat, and the adults scrambled for the other side. Poppy bent down over the bow and, and held out her crying baby brother to Isabel. As if in a dream, Isabel's arms reached up and took him. He was covered with something slimy and gross and was screaming like somebody had slapped him, but he was the most amazing thing Isabel had ever seen. Little Mariano. Isabel hugged him protectively against the push and pull of the waves. He was so tiny, so light. What if she stumbled? What if she dropped him? How could her father have put something so new, so precious in her arms? But then she understood. Isabel had to carry little Mariano to shore so her father and the others could carry mommy behind them. Go, Isabel, her father told her, and she went. Isabel held the ba baby up high to keep him out of the waves that pushed them both to shore. Stumbling as the water crashed against the back of her legs, but step by step, she staggered up onto the beach, onto United States soil. Isabel turned in the sand, soaking wet and exhausted, to look behind her. Poppy and Amara and the Castillos were on their feet, carrying Isabel's mother through the shallow water where the Coast Guard boat couldn't go. The ship had cut its lights and was backing out to sea. On the rear of the boat, among the waving, cheering refugees, was Isabel's grandfather. Isabel held the screaming baby up high for him to see, and Lido fell to his knees, hands clasped to his chest. In the engines roared, the sea turned, and the Coast Guard ship disappeared out to sea. The Castillo and Fernandez families helped each other up onto the sandy beach, and their wet feet became dry feet. Senor Castillo fell to his knees and kissed the ground. They had made it to the States, to freedom. Still in a dream, Isabel wobbled up the sand toward the flashing lights and thumping music and dancing people. She stepped out into the light and the music stopped and everyone turned to stare. Then suddenly people were running to help her and her family. A tan young woman in a bikini dropped into the sand behind his, beside Isabel. Oh my God, Chiquita, she said in Spanish. Did you just come off a boat? Are you Cuban? Yes, Isabel said. She was trembling, but she, come, she clung to Mariano like she would never let him go. I'm from Cuba, Isabel said, but my little brother was born here. He's an American and soon I will be too. Mahmoud, Hungary to Germany, 2015, 17 days from home. Hungarian people on both sides of the road stopped and stared as Mahmoud and the rest of the refugees marched down the middle of the highway. Men, women, children, they had all come pouring out of the detention center after Mahmoud, joined by the UN observers, and the police had done nothing to stop them. The refugees stretched from one side of the northbound lane to the other, blocking cars from passing them. Packs of young Syrian men walked and laughed together. A Palestinian woman pushed a stroller with a sleeping girl in it. An Afghan family sang a song. The refugees wore jeans and sneakers and hoodies tied around their waists and carried what little they still owned in backpacks and trash bags. Mahmoud's father and mother found him and Walid in the crowd. Mahmoud, what are you doing? His father cried. We're walking to Austria, Walid said. Dad showed them the map on his phone. It's a 12-hour walk, he said. We can do it, Mahmoud said. We've already come this far. We can go just a little farther. Mahmoud's mother pulled him into a hug and then Walid and soon their father had joined them. Refugees streamed around them, and when Mahmoud's mother let them all go, she was smiling and crying at the same time. Cars honked behind the marchers, trying to get past. More cars stopped on the other side of the highway to honk and cheer them on or boo them. A policeman pulled up on the opposite side of the road, and through a loudspeaker, a policeman told everyone in Arabic, Stop, or you'll be arrested. But no one stopped, and no one was arrested. Mahmoud and his family walked with the crowd for hours, visible, exposed. It was scary, but energizing, too. They marched quietly, calmly, flashing peace signs at people who cheered them on from the sidelines. Police cars with spinning red lights paced them on the other side of the road, occasionally bleep bleeping to warn some car away. News helicopters flew overhead, and a woman from the New York Times worked her way through the crowd, asking Mahmoud questions and interviewing refugees. See us, Mahmoud thought. Hear us. Help us. Twelve hours had seemed like nothing when Mahmoud added up all the time they'd be walking since they'd left Aleppo. But this walk quickly seemed endless. They had no water and no food, and Mahmoud's stomach growled and his lips were dry. He felt like one of the zombies from his favorite video game. All he wanted to do was lie down and sleep, but Mahmoud knew they couldn't stop. If they stopped, the Hungarians would arrest them. They had to keep moving forward. Always forward, even if it killed them. Later that night, Mahmoud and his family at last reached the border of Austria. 
There was no fence, no wall, no border check post, just a blue traffic sign by the side of the road with the words Republic Österreich inside the EU's circle of gold stars and above it a sign with the red and white flag of Austria. The Hungarian police cars stopped following them as soon as they stepped across the border and the refugees paused to hug each other and celebrate their escape. Mahmoud fell to his knees, fighting back tears of exhaustion and happiness. They had made it. It wasn't Germany, not yet, but Germany was just one country away. The refugees were still laughing and congratulating each other when the phone Mahmoud's father carried beeped an alarm. So did another phone and another until the whole chorus was a, the whole crowd was a chorus of alarms. It was time for the Isha prayer, the last prayer of the day. Mahmoud's dad called, used an app called I Salam to find the exact direction they should face to pray to Mecca. Mahmoud's family found a patch of grass all to themselves, and the hundreds of other refugees did the same. Soon they were all bowing and praying together. It wasn't ideal. They were supposed to wash themselves and pray in a clean place, but it was more important to pray at the right time than in the right place. As he recited the first chapter of the Quran, Mahmoud thought about the words, Thee alone we worship, and thee alone we ask for help. Show us the straight path. Their path had been anything but straight, but Allah had delivered them to this place. With his blessings, they might actually reach Germany. When Mahmoud finished his prayers and opened his eyes, he saw a small group of Austrians had gathered at the edges of the praying refugees. There were police officers there too, and more cars with flashing lights. Mahmoud sagged. They only see us when we do something they don't like, he thought again. The refugees had stopped to get down on their knees and pray, and these people watching them didn't like that. and didn't understand. Now the refugees looked foreign again, alien, like they didn't belong. Mahmoud worried what the crowd might do when the Austrians told them they didn't want them. Their march through Hungary had been peaceful until now. Would this turn into another fight that would see them gassed and handcuffed and thrown into prison again? Welcome to Austria, one of the Austrians said in heavily accented Arabic, and others yelled, we'll come in, and applauded. Actually applauded them. Mahmoud looked around at Walid, who was as stunned as Mahmoud. Was there some mistake? Did these people think they were something other than Syrian refugees? Suddenly they were surrounded by Austrians, men, women, and children, all smiling and trying to shake their hands and give them things. A woman gave Mahmoud's mother a handful of clean clothes, and a man worried over his father's cuts and bruises. A woman about Mahmoud's age wearing a New York Yankees jersey handed him a plastic shopping bag with bread and cheese and fruit and a bottle of water in it. Mahmoud was so thankful he almost wept. Thank you, Mahmoud said in Arabic. Bitte, the boy said, which Mahmoud guessed was German for you're welcome. The Austrians, they learned, had seen their march on the television and had come out to help them. It was like that all the way up the road to Nikolsdorf, the closest Austrian town with a train station. White, native-born Austrians and olive-skinned Arab Austrians who had recently immigrated to the country filled the overpasses, throwing bottles of water and food down to them. Bread, fresh fruit, bags of chips. A man next to Mahmoud caught a whole grilled chicken wrapped in aluminum foil. We are with you. Go with God, a woman shouted down to them in Arabic. Mahmoud's heart lifted. They weren't invisible anymore, hidden away in the detention center. People were finally seeing them, and good people were helping them. At last, Mahmoud and his family reached the Nikolsdorf train station, where they bought tickets to Vienna, the capital of Austria. They traveled overnight by train, and when they arrived in Vienna the next morning, they bought tickets to Munich, a large city in Germany. In Munich, the response was the same as in Austria, only bigger. There were thousands of refugees at the train station, and moving among them were hundreds of re regular German people offering bottles of water and cups of coffee and tea. One couple had bought a basket of candy and were handing pieces out to children. Mahmoud and Walid joined the happy mob of kids around them and each got a couple of candies, which they wolfed down. More organized effort was unloading a truck full of fresh fruit and another group was handing out diapers to anyone with babies. Seeing the diapers reminded Mahmoud of Hana and he looked up at his mother. He could tell she was thinking of his baby sister too. She put a hand to her mouth and soon she was working her way through the crowd again, asking anyone and everyone if they had seen her daughter. But no one had seen or heard of a baby plucked from the water. If the people who had rescued her made it to safety, though, they were likely somewhere here in Germany. Mahmoud and his family would just have to keep looking. An official-looking German man with a name tag that said Serhat, a Turkish name, approached Mahmoud's family with a clipboard in hand. Are you and your family seeking asylum in Germany? He asked in a perfect Arabic. Mahmoud held his breath. Was this it? Was the end of their long, horrible Germany... Uh, so, excuse me. Was the end of their long, horrible nightmare near? Could they finally stop moving, stop sleeping, and praying in doorways and bus stations? In Germany, Mahmoud and his family could make new lives for themselves. Mahmoud could finally find a way to reconnect with Walid. They could find Hana, get his dad laughing and joking again, find peace for his mom. After coming so far, after losing so much, it felt like Mahmoud and his family were almost to the promised land. All they had to do was make room in their hearts for Germany the way it had made room for them and accept the strange new place as their home. Yes, Mahmoud's father said, a smile slowly growing on his face. A thousand times yes.
Isabel, Miami, Florida, 1994. This was the coda to Isabel's song. She stood with a trumpet in hand, a gift from Uncle Guillermo, Lido's brother. She wasn't on a sidewalk in Havana, but in a classroom in Miami. It was her second week of school and the first day of band class, the day they auditioned for their places in the orchestra. Isabel twiddled her fingers on the trumpet's keys. She couldn't believe she was standing here in this classroom, less than a month after stumbling on, onto Miami Beach with her baby brother in, its, in her arms. So much had changed so quickly. After her mother and brother had been taken to the hospital and given a clean bill of health, Lido's brother, Guillermo, took them in until they found a little apartment of their own. His apartment was smaller than their house in Cuba and not near the beach, but if Isabel never saw the ocean again, that was fine by her. Little Mariana was at home, getting fat and happy along with the other babies mommy was paid to watch at the little in-house daycare she ran. Poppy had gotten a job driving a taxi and was saving up for a car of their own. Senor Castillo planned to go back to school to become an American lawyer, and Senor Castillo was already talking to someone about getting a loan to open a restaurant. Luis got to work in a little bodega in Amara in a dress shop, and once Amara became a U.S. citizen, she planned to become a Miami police officer. They were going to be married in the winter. And Isabel, she had started the sixth grade. It was hard because she didn't speak English yet, but there were other Cuban kids there, lots more Cuban kids, a few who had come to America by, to America by boat like her, but more who had been born here, Cubano-Americanos, who still spoke Spanish at home. Isabel had quickly made friends, girls and boys, who were warm and welcoming, and she knew she would learn to speak English like her teacher soon enough. She was practicing by watching lots and lots of television. At least that's what she told her parents. She would learn, and in the meantime, math and Spanish and art class all still made sense. And so did music. Senor Villanueva and the other students waited for her to play. Isabel had practiced for weeks for this moment. At first, she couldn't decide what song to play, but then, while watching a baseball game with her father, she had figured it out. Isabel adjusted Yvonne's Industriales baseball cap on her head, took a deep breath, and began to play the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem of the United States. But she didn't play it like she heard it at baseball games on the television. She played it like a song cubano, offbeat, with a guajeo melody. Isabel played it salsa for Yvonne, lost at sea, and for Lido, back in Cuba. She played it salsa for her mother and her father, who had left their homeland, and for her little brother, Mariano, who would never know the streets of Havana the way she had. And Isabel played it salsa for herself, so she would never forget where she came from, who she was. Soon, Isabel had everyone in the room clapping along to the beat with her, but as she played a different rhythm, a beat underneath the one everyone else was clapping to. Her foot tapped in time with the hidden cadence, and she realized with a thrill that she was finally hearing it. She was finally counting clave. Lido was wrong. She didn't have to be in Havana to hear it, to feel it. She had brought Cuba with her to Miami. Isabel finished with a flourish, and Senor Villanueva and the other students cheered. She thought she might cry for happiness, but she bit back her tears. She had done enough crying over Ivan and Lido. The song of her leaving Cuba to find a new home was over. Today, it was time to start a new song. Mahmoud, Berlin, Germany, 2015, Home. A German song Mahmoud had never heard before played on the radio of the van that took him and his family through the streets of Berlin. The capital of Germany was the biggest city he had ever seen, far bigger than Aleppo. It was filled with nightclubs and cafes and shops and monuments and statues and apartments and office buildings. Almost all the signs were in German, but here and there he saw a sign in Arabic advertising a clothing store or a restaurant or a market. Buildings lined the sidewalks like ten-story walls of brick and glass, and cars and bicycles and buses and trams rattled and honked and clanged by in the streets. This strange, frightening, exciting place was to be Mahmoud's new home. The German government had taken in Mahmoud and his family. For the past four weeks, the four of them had lived in a school in Munich that had been turned into simple but clean housing for refugees. They had stayed there, free to come and go as they pleased, until a host family agreed to let them share their home when Mahmoud's family got on their feet. A host family here, on this street, in the capital of the country. The van pulled up to the curb outside a little green house with white shutters and an A-frame roof. Flowers filled the window boxes like Mahmoud had seen in Austria, and two German cars were parked in the driveway. Across the street in a park, teenagers did tricks on skateboards. Mahmoud's father slid open the side door for them to get out, and Mahmoud and his mother and brother grabbed the backpacks filled with the clothes, toiletries, and bedrolls the German relief workers had given them. The relief worker who had driven them led Mahmoud's mother and father and brother up the steps to the front door of the little house, but Mahmoud stood for a moment on the sidewalk, looking around at the neighborhood. Mahmoud knew from his history class back in Syria that Berlin had been all but destroyed by the end of World War II, reduced to a pile of rubble like Aleppo was now. Would it take another 70 years for Syria to return from the ashes the way Germany had? Would he ever see Aleppo again? Cries of joy and welcome came from the porch, and Mahmoud followed his family up the steps. 
His mother was being hugged by an elderly German woman, and an elderly German man was shaking hands with his father. The German relief worker had to translate everything they said to each other. Mahmoud and his family didn't speak German yet, and the family apparently didn't speak any Arabic. The German family had at least managed a sign written in Arabic that said, Welcome home on it, even if the expression they used was a bit formal. Mahmoud still appreciated the effort. It was better than he could do in German. The man shaking hands with his father turned to Mahmoud and Walid, and what Mahmoud saw surprised him. He was a really old man. He had wrinkly white skin and thin white hair that stuck out a bit on the sides, like he tried to comb it, but it wouldn't stay put. When the relief worker had told him they'd be staying with a German family, Mahmoud had imagined a family like his own, not like his grandparents. His name is Saul Rosenberg, the relief worker translated, and he says, welcome to your new home. As Mahmoud shook the old man's hand, he spotted a small, thin, ornate wooden box attached to the frame just outside the front door. Mahmoud recognized the symbol on the box. It was the Star of David, the same symbol on the flag of Israel. Mahmoud tried not to show his surprise. Not only was this couple old, they were Jewish. Back in the Middle East, Mahmoud knew, Jews and Muslims had been fighting each other for decades. This was a strange new world. Air Rosenberg's wife broke away from Mahmoud's mother and bent down to say hello. She was a wide woman, white-haired like her husband, with big round glasses and a gap-toothed friendly smile. From the pocket of her frock, she withdrew a little stuffed rabbit made of white corduroy and offered it to Walid. His eyes lit up as he took it from her. Frau Rosenberg made it herself. She's a toy designer, the translator explained. The old woman said something directly to Mahmoud. She says she th would have made one for you too, the translator said, but she thought you might be too old for stuffed animals. Mahmoud nodded. She can make one for my little sister though when we find her, he told the relief worker. We had to hand her off to another boat to save her when we were drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. It was my fault. I'm the one who told my mother to do it, and now I have to find her and bring her back. Frau Rosenberg looked questioningly at the relief workers he translated, and her bright smile faded. Walid ran off to show his mother his new toy, and the old woman led Mahmoud into the hallway just inside the house where family pictures hung on the wall. I was a refugee once, just like you, the old woman said through the interpreter, and I lost my brother. She pointed to an old brown photograph in a picture frame of a, mo of a mother and father and two children, a boy about Mahmoud's age in glasses, and a little girl. The father and son wore suits and ties, and the mother wore a pretty dress with big buttons. The girl was dressed like a little sailor. That's me there, the girl. That's my family. We left Germany on a ship in 1939 trying to get to Cuba to escape the Nazis. I was very little then, and I'm very old now, and I don't remember too much about that time, but I do remember my father being sick, and a cartoon about a cat. I remember that, and a very nice policeman who let me wear his hat. My father was the only one who made it to Cuba. He lived there for many years, long after the war, but I never saw him again. He died before we could find each other. The rest of us couldn't leave the ship with him, and no other country would take us. So they brought us back to Europe just in time for the war, just in time to go on the run again. The Nazis caught us, and they gave my mother a choice. Save me, or save my brother. Well, she couldn't choose. How could she? So my brother chose for her. His name was Joseph. Mahmoud watched as she reached out and gently touched the boy in the photograph, leaving a smudge on the glass. He's about your age, I think. I don't remember much about him, but I do remember he always wanted to be a grown-up. I don't have time for games, he would tell me. I'm a man now. And when those soldiers said one of us could go free and the other would be taken to a concentration camp, Joseph said, take me. My brother, just a boy, becoming a man at last. She paused a moment, then took the picture down off the wall reverently with both hands. They took my mother and my brother away from me that day and left me alone there in the woods. I only survived because a kind old French lady took me in. She told the next Nazis who came knocking that I was family. When the war was over and I was old enough, I came back here to Germany to look for my mother and brother. I searched for them a long time, but they had died in the concentration camps, both of them. The woman drew a breath. I only have this picture of them because a cousin kept it, a cousin who was hidden away by a Christian family throughout the war. Here in Germany, I met my husband, Saul. He had also survived the Holocaust. We stayed because he had family here, and we made a family of our own, Frau Rosenberg said. She spread her arms wide and turned in the little hallway, showing Mahmoud the dozens of pictures of her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She put her hand to the old yellow picture of her family again. They died so I could live. Do you understand? They died so all these people could live. All the grandchildren and nieces and nephews they never got to meet. But you'll get to meet them, she told Mahmoud. You're still alive and so is your little sister somewhere. I know it. You saved her and together we'll find her. Yes, I promise. We'll find her and bring her home. Mahmoud started to cry and he turned away and tried to blink back his tears. The old Jewish woman put her arms around him and pulled him into a tight hug. Everything's going to be all right now, she whispered. We'll help you. Ruthie, come here. Frau Rosenberg's husband called to her. 
Mahmoud didn't need a translator to tell him that Herr Rosenberg wanted them to join him in the living room. Mahmoud dragged his sleeve across his wet eyes, and Frau Rosenberg tried to hang the picture back on the wall. Her old hands were too shaky, though, and Mahmoud took it for, from her and hung it back on its nail for her. His gaze lingered on the picture. He was filled with sadness for the boy his age, the boy who had died so Ruthie could live. But Mahmoud was also filled with gratitude. Joseph had died so Ruthie could live and one day welcome Mahmoud and his family into her home. The old woman gave Mahmoud's arm a squeeze and she led him into the living room. Mom and dad were there and Walid and Air Rosenberg and the space was bright and alive and filled with books and pictures of family and the smell of good food. It felt like a home.